Hello, and welcome to this Gas Step webinar supported by Energy Connects. My name is Christine Toms Knox, and I am Manager of Innovation and Digital Solutions at Bechtel Energy. At Bechtel, the greatest and most rewarding thing we do as an EPC is to turn our customers' vision into a reality by designing, buying, and building the extraordinary, which we have been doing for 125 years in 2023. The most fundamental and exciting thing we do is execute projects that create opportunity, build a path to net zero, protect people on the planet, and accelerate progress to connect communities and resources and opportunities around the world. We offer the complete spectrum of engineering, procurement, and construction services for the hydrocarbon, infrastructure, water treatment, and renewable markets from concept to detailed design, fully self-performed construction and startup right through to support plant services during operations. We are excited to be here today to have an opportunity to hear from some of the top subject matter experts in our industry on a range of topics around modernized design. It is imperative that we as an industry constantly push the boundaries of how we design, build and operate facilities. The topics that the panelists are presenting today are leading the global energy conversations. Today, more than 400 people from all over the world have registered for our webinar, Modernized Design to Lower Carbon Energy Projects, proudly sponsored by Bechtel. Many thanks to all of you for your support and being here. You're encouraged to submit your questions and answers to our expert panel using the Q&A function. We will try to get to as many of those as possible. Shortly, I will introduce our panelists, but before I do, a quick reminder that the call for papers for the 2023 Gas Tech Technical and Commercial Conferences is now open. For more information about the conference and exhibition, please visit www.gastechevent.com forward slash call hyphen for hyphen papers. Again, that's www.gastechevent.com forward slash call hyphen hyphen or call hyphen for hyphen papers. As with previous webinars in this series today, we will showcase three of the standout presentations delivered during the Gas Tech 2022 EPC and Gas Processing Conference. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Barry McGinn. Director of Capital Projects for CyberHawk. Barry operates a global capacity in a global capacity to drive growth for CyberHawk's visual intelligence platform, iHawk, which is a world leading UAV data capture and surveying capability platform for mega capital project delivery in the energy and construction markets. Barry has over 15 years working in the construction software market, closely with tier one contractors and asset owners worldwide to help them develop and achieve their digital transformation strategies. Today, Barry will be speaking on his paper entitled, How a Combination of Drones and Data Visualization Software Can Transform the Construction Monitoring Process. For us at Bechtel, data visualization software is a paramount to our success and field productivity. We recently used the iHawk platform with great success on one of our largest EPC projects in recent years and it was a valuable tool for planning and alignment. Barry, I'll open the floor to you. Thank you, Christy, and uh, thank you all for uh, for attending this uh, this morning, this afternoon, wherever you are. It's uh, it's a pleasure for me to be able to uh, to present, um, just like it was at the Gas Tech event in Milan um, a couple of months ago. Okay, so yeah, as Christy mentions, um, I'm the uh, the global sales director here at Cyberhawk, and I'm just going to take you through um, an example of, uh, of of how the uh, you know, the deployment of drones and uh, an accompanying visualization software can really provide benefits to uh, to major capital projects. As, as Christy mentioned, we were very proud to work alongside Bechtel and, and their client Shell on a on a large facility uh, which has just uh, become operational in the US. Um, a couple of weeks ago, and some of the examples that we'll be looking at today were part of that project as well. So, um, so like I say, excited to be able to show you. So just to be able to um, to 
introduced Cyberhawk here. So Cyberhawk um, is, is a business that's been around since 2008. Um, we consider ourselves a, a world leader in, in uh, visual data capture and, and visual data management. And we've based the majority of our work in that 15 years around um, the use of, of drones. We were one of the first companies in the world to actually fly um, drones or, or manned aerial vehicles around um, oil and gas facilities, um, typically for things like inspection and, um, and maintenance and integrity um, checks. Um, we've operated um, in, in, in over 30, over 37 countries. I guess that's almost 40 now. But um, we've performed over 100,000 commercial flights in that time. And, you know, there, there's not a facility or a, a part of the world where we, we haven't sent our guys with our equipment to, uh, to capture the, the data from that unique perspective that, uh, that, that a drone provides. So let me just, there we go. So in terms of drone capabilities, drones are becoming ever more commonplace um, on construction projects. And like I say, oil and gas have, adapted, have adopted this technology for, for a long time. And, and it's becoming more commonplace now in the, in the field of capital project delivery. But what people probably don't realize is, is the number of different data sets you can actually capture by using, by using drones and flying them over the, uh, the facilities. Um, so as you would expect, this is the ability to capture high resolution images. You know, we call them author photos. And then essentially what they are is using a, a technique called author mosaic is we're actually taking thousands of images and stitching them together into one, uh, into one larger image. What this allows uh, our clients to do is get that full visibility of their, their project site and, and how it's progressing and being able to compare that with other data sets over time. And it's not just flat two, 2D imagery. We can capture that uh, kind of panoramic 3D, more immersive perspective as well. Obviously, things like point clouds and mesh models have been used quite commonly in the industry now for a number of years, but they can also be created from uh, the data being captured by drones. And the way the drone technology and the associated payloads are developing now is we're pretty much at the same level of accuracy and quality that you would get from a terrestrial capturing exercise as well, you know, from, from the ground. We can explore digital elevation models as well in terms of being able to understand um, you know, the, the, the terrain in which these projects are being built upon, as well as then integrating other data sets like ground-based aerial tours, multispectral and thermal data output, outputs, and high-definition video. So as you can imagine, the drone technology is much more established now than, say, it was a few years ago, but the rate of innovation hasn't slowed. And, and it's exciting to see what new uh, technologies come out there. And every time I go to a new event or a new conference, there's new drone-based technology to, uh, to explore. And what we're seeing is an understanding from senior management within the industry now as to the benefits that drones can bring. A recent um, report by PwC called Skies Without Limits said that most senior leaders believe that there are considerable, um, there are considerable, um, Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm pushed that. Thank you. Yeah, just being <laughs> noted that I hadn't pushed my slide there. What I um, the uh, senior leadership are noting that there are considerable savings to be made in the key areas such as time improvements, productivity improvements, safety improvements, and really leading that drive of digital transformation. Great. So one of the key workflows and one of the key um, uh, kind of value propositions of utilizing drones is from what we call construction monitoring. And from a construction monitoring perspective, um, the drone can provide many, many, many benefits. Um, as I've mentioned there a couple of times, you get a unique um, perspective from uh, from flying drones around the site that you would get from a, you know, the uh, the terrestrial, more traditional terrestrial approach. Why is that gone back? Sorry. Why not move? Thank you. Um, yep. Yeah, so as I was mentioning there, you get that unique perspective that a drone um, can, can give you. Um, we found that in, in many cases, the, the drone imagery and, and the, the data that it's capturing is leading to more factual based decision making. And this can obviously be then obviously shared through a, a visualization platform and be made available all around the world just through a web browser. So from a claim resolution perspective, we can get access to this data for, for everybody who needs to be involved in that, uh, in that, uh, you know, those checks, those progress checks and uh, uh, things like that, and, and be able to make those decisions based upon the evidence. Um, it also helps drive project controls, providing additional data sets for improved decision making to the project management team. 
Um, we could also lead to site safety by having less people on site, reducing costs by, again, not uh, requiring people to deliver site and be able to spot um, issues before they become um, you know, more difficult to deal with. And ultimately, this can help drive um, ESG strategy as well by reducing the emissions, um, not just from the project itself, but from the reduced amount of travel. So, so people are able to view these construction sites from anywhere in the world and track the progress without having to go there in person. This was particularly pertinent during COVID, uh, where obviously the amount of travel um, was, was vastly, vastly reduced. So as I mentioned there, the drones can be used for, for capturing all the different data sets. But if you haven't got a solution in which to um, display that data and, and understand it in a simple to use and collaborative manner, you're not getting the full value from it. So as Christy mentioned, we worked with uh, with Bechtel and, uh, and their client Shell on, on a project in the US where the iHawk software was not just deployed, but it was actually developed alongside the requirements of these two key industry players. And so from a data visualization perspective, the iHawk software that we built out kind of falls into three categories or has three kind of key value propositions. It's providing access to the wider project team from a geospatial and visualization perspective. We all know that Esri's ArcGIS platform is a fantastic application and used ubiquitously across the industry. However, it takes a, an element of, of training and, um, and a specialism to be able to access the data in that format. What we're trying to do with iHawk is bring the value of the drawn data and the geospatial data to the other 99%. Um, just, to, just to know, guys, are, are you seeing the slide that I'm presenting at the moment? Um, I'm just getting notes that you're only seeing slide nine and I'm up to 14. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll just continue uh, and hopefully the uh, the system will, will, will catch up. Yeah, okay, thank you. No, we're on 14, thank you. Okay, cool. So what, what, on top of um, what we're able to do with the, uh, the geospatial data, we're also then able to integrate the um, integrate other point solutions. Um, so not only being able to visualize the, the site as it's being developed from a visual perspective, but actually be able to bring through other data sets from other point solutions, things like EDMS platforms, ARP solutions, uh, IoT devices. And as I mentioned there, it's about data democratization. It's about bringing this data to the much wider project team. There were up to 6,000 workers on this site in the, in the US um, earlier, and all of them could access this data through a very simple format, rather than having to, you say, be, be trained in a more specialist system. So from a system perspective, the everything was built upon the ortho view, as, as I mentioned there, and this provided complete visualization of the site, allowed us to interact with the map um, in, in terms of being able to overlay different data sets and track progress from different, um, different data capture exercises. It allowed us to measure distances and areas, and more recently we've uh, developed functionality to allow us to measure volumetrics as well. Um, we can also overlay site schematics here as well, so we can compare the original design to how the site is progressing in real life, and again, be able to give us that indication of how the site is progressing against the original plan. And this acts as the bedrock for all of the other data sets. Um, on top of that, we could then provide a more unique, immersive perspective using the 360 application here. And this was aerial and terrestrial. What this allowed us to do was provide this kind of almost it's a immersive perspective of the uh, of the site. And this was used typically for things like um, site inductions and uh, uh, toolbox talks quite often. Given the size and scale of this project, it is the size of a small town essentially, and we had a population of a small town in there as well working on it at any one time. It was important for them to understand, you know, from a, from a um, situational perspective, the, the area that they were working on. And again, understanding where to go in case of emergencies, understanding where they were going to get their lunch that day, understanding where deliveries were going to be dropped and which areas they were going to be expected to access. And from that perspective, we then built out further functionality, which allowed us to almost annotate the project data that we were capturing there. Again, this was used for things like coordinating work streams and managing laydown areas and overall logistical planning. Again, just pre coming up with new and innovative ways to take advantage of this high resolution data that had been collected. This was particularly powerful as not only, again, was it able to show us which areas certain equipment was going to be available in or areas where certain activities were going to be, sorry, my slides keep on skipping. 
um, yes, where certain activities were going to be taking place. Um, it, it allowed us to, again, bring through different data sets and allow people to get that perspective. And then the integration points that I mentioned was that we managed to geo-reference an entire EGMS system or, or common data environment. So any particular piece of data that had a location associated with it, whether it was a drawing, a document, an equipment tag, um, or anything else for that matter, could be surfaced through this drawn data. What this allowed people to do was able to essentially draw a box around a certain part of the site, and then all of the documents and drawings associated with that particular part of the facility would come to life in front of them there. And then finally, one of the key um, integrations that we, we managed to build out here was the ability to surface data from RFID tags or IoT devices. So this could be equipment in terms of monitoring the performance of equipment or the performance of uh, other facilities, bringing through key information like temperature, pressure from, uh, from, sense, from, uh, from sensors in hard to reach places. So overall, the whole point of the platform here was to bring through the top 10, 15% of the data from multiple point solutions and bringing it into an environment that people understood. I'd just like to finish off um, by just go, going through a, uh, a, uh, a reference that we got from Shell on this project, which really brings home the value that, um, that IHawk brought to the job. And as you can see there, I'll read it out there, that IHawk became an inseparable part of what we do. And that collection of site imagery captured over time contributed to countless progress and cost reviews with the major contractors and subcontractors on the project. Um, making these decision making processes, you know, factual, evidence based, transparent and fair. And I think if you can deploy a digital solution that not only improves productivity, but also improves transparency and fairness and decision making on the project then it's certainly something worth exploring and, and, and deploying on further jobs going forward, which thankfully we're, we've done with, uh, with Shell post this, uh, post this project. So that's a, a bit of a whistle stop tour of what, I've, uh, of what I could talk to you about. If anybody you know, has questions, I'll be delighted to answer them at the end of the, uh, of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Next, we have Constantine Lau, director at Schneider Electric. Constantine is a global director of oil and gas with Snyder Electric and holds over 20 years of experience in industrial automation and software. He is responsible for the oil and gas segment business strategies and sales and marketing programs worldwide. Constantine has published numerous articles on sustainability, industrial automation, energy optimization, optimization and AI systems. Constantine will be presenting his paper entitled eight strategies to drive enterprise profitability through integrated power management and process automation. Constantine, this is a very interesting topic. Digital transformation cannot be considered in a standalone capacity. Organizational and cultural shifts must also be considered in a well thought out roadmap to align and support new technologies. Thank you and please take it away. Yeah, Christine, thank you for the introduction and the opportunity to present at this uh, webinar. It's a pleasure for me to be here. I just want to make sure uh, on the live screen right now, we're seeing the slides, the uh, improved probability and sustainability. Are we seeing that right now? Yes? Okay. All right, let me go to the next slide. Um, how digital design and power and process combined approach can help you. It can help you reduce capex, reduce risk and schedule. It can also help improve the operational efficiency of the plan that is measured by KPI uptime throughput and energy effectiveness. It can also improve process efficiency as processes become more and more electrifying. And also to deal with different sources of energy for carbon reduction. And uh, we heard a lot about the uh, renewable energy, you know, in, into uh, like offshore wind and also renewable energy being incorporated into the power grid of the uh, refinery. These are petrochemical plants nowadays. Now, the future presents a very strong case for unified power and process because electrification is projected to increase by two to three times by 2050. Now, currently only five to 15% of the oil and gas are electrified today. So if you look at the midstream segment like LNG, electrification re represents only 5%. Now, LNG plants are quite energy intensive. A typical size can run from a few hundred megawatts, sometimes 500 megawatts to 600 megawatts. Um, 
So decarbonize, to decarbonize, oil and gas companies can have a few options to consider, like CCOS, hydrogen, energy efficiency improvement, electrification, et cetera. Now, the advantage of electrification that is, is highly efficient, typically in the 80, 90% efficient range, compared to a typical gas fire or coal fire power source, are only in the range of 40, 60%. So there's a lot of wasted energy in there. So electrification projects are also typically scalable and most often are, are, are positive ROI project. Now compared to a CCUS project that are pretty massive and capital intensive that require infrastructures like a CCUS hub or geolog geological storage space close by. So with a strong projection electrification due to decarbonization, oil and gas projects need to start thinking about incorporating electrification into design, engineering, operations, and maintenance. There are two key areas in process electrification of oil and gas. Uh, the first one is the electrification of machine drive, like the movement and transportation of gas and liquid uh, happen in the motor, pumps, and compressors. Now, the second electrification use case is the electrification of heat. This is related to the combustion of fossil fuel to generate the heat in the furnaces, steam boilers, and fire heaters. For well, my gas tech audiences, I want you to look at the, the uh, first column, the leftmost column in the one to 10 megawatt range, in the leftmost column. The replacement of gas and diesel compressors with electrical motors typically in upstream onshore production. Now, XTO, ExxonMobil recently announced that they are gonna targeting net zero in their Permian operations by electric, electrifying all the compressors by 2030. So this is a massive undertaking to electrify the whole field. Another use case, if you look at the, the middle column, is the in the 100 megawatt range, uh, the complete electrification of LNG train. This is the replacement of gas driven, dri driven compressors by centralized power gen and electrical motors, potentially connection to grid or renewables. Now, if you look at the right two columns, the electrification of heat in the refinery and petrochemical can be a huge application because almost 50 to 60% of the emissions come from these heating sources of cracker, heater, steam boilers, and reformer. Now, digital design, power and process intimately linked and are the two key elements of digital transformation. Without power and automation, a plant cannot be run. Now, in general, there are three sources of data within the plant, which is the energy data, who, who, who get, illustrate the electrification, decarbonization, and multiple power source data. And also, you have the process efficiency data that illustrates productivity, safety, and sustainability data. And thirdly, you have the resiliency data, which is the asset data, which you kept all the assets, and it documents all the availability and asset performance. Now, typically, all these three data are in silos and sometimes uh, provided by three different vendors. And unified power and process, the unification of these data throughout the life cycle of the plan. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Digital design, design once and used many times throughout the plan life cycle. Now, once a digital twin is developed, it can be used throughout the entire plan life cycle from design to change management, to startup, engineering commissioning, to operator training system, to operations optimization, and to asset performance management to reduce downtime. This is an end-to-end -end digital twin solution. Unified power and process can deliver a lifetime of value. It can help reduce capex by 20%, improve process energy usage by up to 10%, reduce unplanned downtime by up to 15%, and help improve profitability by up to 3%. Now, this is based on conservative estimates from some of the customer references that we had. I will give a few examples towards the end of my presentation. There are eight unified power and process strategy to achieve your goals, but today I'm only gonna cover four that are relevant to my topic of digital design today, and also focus on the strategies that can deliver immediate high ROIs. That's highlighted in the blue uh, circle for one, two, five, and six. Now, if you look at number one, digital twin and unify engineering that can optimize design and streamline engineering. And the bubble number two in blue is optimized power and process design that can reduce footprint, risk, and costs. If you look at bubble number five, blue, 
the unified power and process system that will help plant operate at the maximum efficiency. And the bubble number six, integrated asset performance management that goes hand in hand with unified power and process system. Let me just dive into a little bit deeper of what these, each strategy is all about. Now, to optimize design and to do risk project engineering, there are a few strategies and solutions that can help you achieve this. Number one is digital twins. As I mentioned before, a few slides ago, once a digital twin is developed, and I talk about digital twin of electrical system, elect uh, digital twin for a process system, and digital twin also for equipment. These are three different digital twins. And they are integrated, and then it can be developed, and it can be used throughout the life cycle. Now, number two is the Unify Engineering. Unify Engineering is Aviva Engineering methodology and solutions that automate design and engineering to streamline the change process. A centralized cloud-based data-centric environment for real engineering data. It spans the concept conceptual design from front-end engineering FED feed and detailed design phase of your project lifecycle. Now, power and process system design optimization can help reduce footprint risk and costs. If you look at the top, the leftmost uh, top title is optimized. You can optimize electrical and power generation by eliminating cookie cutter approach, which can be most of the time over design and creating and creating a fit for purpose design that can eliminate waste. This helps reduce energy requirement, hence reducing the number of equipment and footprint. You can see some of the examples I've given down there. The power distribution footprint is reduced by 30% and the distribution also reduced by 55%. This is a massive uh, capital savings here. And if you look at the middle column, which is eliminate wiring, by integrating electrical and automation system, you can eliminate separate hard wiring of two different systems. Many of the electrical systems can be connected to automation system through the IEC, IEC 61850 serial link. CapEx wise, Integrating the intelligent power motor management control to the DCS via fiber optics and connect the pump fan in instrument cable to the field IO instead of motor control center, the cable savings can be huge. Estimate savings of 50, 60% control wiring and 70% in terminations. If we look at the rightmost column, the reduced footprint, automation and power system can be integrated into the same e-house, therefore provide a very huge potential eliminating e-house e -house footprint. Operate more efficiently. In most traditional plants, the process control system and the electrical management systems are separated. So the electrical information and process information are also separated. In this strategy, we propose a unified power and process system that will help you with one optimized design to maximize operational efficiency. Now, optimized design means that you will only have one system to learn, to operate, to update, and to maintain. This means faster learning curve, easier software updates. The electrical information stored in the historian for trend analysis versus the traditional spot data. Once that electrical information is in the, in the trend, you can set up this alarm, you can set it for alert, you can monitor it. And secondly, you can also manage the situation. Electrical information is shared with operators. One of the most common cross applications is pumps and motors that are traditionally only controlled by the electrical controller. Now, in certain situations, the operator can trip the plan by drawing too much power. Once the electrical devices like switch gear, relays, variable speed drives, pumps and motors in the DCS, it can be trained and can be analyzed. I had a client tell me a story that he having to urgently travel to Russia to resolve an LNG plant startup issue because the vendors for the DCS system and the vendor for the electrical systems were pointing fingers at each other. And he said in the future, he wants to have a 2020 rule. What he means by that, he wants to have 20 people who knows how to resolve the problem under 20 minutes. In order to achieve that, you need to have a unified power and process systems. Which leads me to a quick, quickly diagnosed event you see in the right column here. When something has failed or the plan is shut down, you want to figure out the cost as fast as possible because the lost production means lost profit. With electrical information integrated, the operator can have a comprehensive diagnostic that can increase the chance of fast recovery, many times through sequence of events capability. Now, this is a personal story of mine. 
During the earlier part of my career, I spent about three or four years in the petrochemical plant, starting my plant. And one time the plant was shut down due to a lightning. Now, once we figured out the control system was okay, we still could not start up the plant because we did not know which power system, electrical system was stripped and potentially damaged. And worst case scenario at that time, we have no visibility into the electrical power system data. So it took us almost two days to figure out the source of the issues. And sometimes related to, it was related to a break and also related to the cable. So we have to test each of those components manually, one by one. So it took us almost two days to start up the plant again. Now, if we had a unified power and process system at that time, I'm pretty sure we could have started up in a few hours instead of a few days. When we talk about assets in the plan or enterprise, it includes all the physical assets that includes, but not limited to exchanger, heaters, compressors, automations, pumps, motors, valve, transmitters, variable speed drive, transformer, switch ports, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the ultimate objective is to improve uptime and reduce maintenance costs. Now in this integrated asset management strategy, there are three innovative approach you need to consider here. Number one is the digital twin approach, where I mentioned before. The digital twins are created for all your plant assets that include 3D modeling and the physical properties, the specification, the maintenance documentation, even including the maintenance instruction video, et cetera. Now this model can be used throughout the life cycle of the plan once it's being developed. Number two is the integrated asset approach, one platform, one database for all the assets. This includes process automation, electrical and mechanical assets. Number three is the health data, as health data assets can be collected and analyzed in real time. The objective is to provide early warning detection that enables predictive maintenance. There are two options to achieve this. A is to bring this data to analyze by experts, either by Schneider Electric experts or by your own experts or your own equipment supply experts. Or the other option, this data can be monitored continuously by analytics and algorithms. They came in the form of pattern recognition or machine learning. Uh, I just want to show you the chart of uh, how the comprehensive asset performance management is being conducted. We just look at some of the service plan and, and all the assets that goes across the uh, X axis. Let's look at a few reference case stories that, uh, that we had here to illustrate the unifying upon process. This is a Petrobel Ini Zor. This is one of the largest gas discovery plant, uh, gas discovery ever made in Egypt and the Mediterranean Sea, covering more than 30 trillion cubic feet of gas. The integration of electrical and process automation in the diverse in the delivery of 17 e houses and complete power and power and control system delivered by one project management. The, the result was a 25% faster project execution and delivery on time to gas kept by from five years to 2.3 years. This is a massive increase in productivity for extra 2.7 years. Uh, LNG, Nigeria LNG Limited, is a major player in the global liquefied LNG market with total production capacity of 22 million tons per annum year and also 5 million tons per annual for natural gas liquids for a six train plant complex. Now they were, by using the asset performance management solutions from uh, Schneider Electric, they were able to generate two to $4 million trip cost savings in average. The last one is the LNG leader in the Middle East, one of the world's largest LNG gas facilities in the Middle East. They were implementing tightly integrated electrical and automation systems in their project. They were able to reduce commission times by two months. And it also fully integrated holistic cybersecurity system solutions was being implemented here. In conclusion, I have just talked about how digital design and power and process combined approach can help you reduce capex, reduce risk and schedule, improve operational efficiency, improve process efficiency as process become more electrified and to deal with different source of energy for carbon reduction. I also illustrated about four strategies how to achieve this goal which is digital twin and unified engineering, optimized power and process system design, unified power and process system, and integrated asset performance management. Those are some of the solutions we just talked about today. Thank you for the um, opportunity to present here. I pass it back to you, Christine. Thank you, Constantine. Our final presenter today is Marco Baldini. Marco works as hydrogen solutions architect 
of Gas Turbines and Systems and Baker Hughes Climate Technology Solutions Organization. He supports companies worldwide in the early engagement phase, evaluating multiple scenarios for innovative, viable solutions towards net zero. Marco develops tailor-made feasibility and business cases with customers' viewpoints and impacts in mind. Marco began his career as a design engineer with an Italian telecommunications company in 1997. He has 20 years experience in the global oil and gas space, as well as four years in the hydrogen space. Marco's presentation today is entitled, Gas Turbine Systems with Diffusion Flame Combustion and Fuel Blending for Reducing Undesired Emissions. Marco, we are constantly searching for the best solutions to lower our CO2 emissions in the production of energy. And currently this is very paramount with the LNG production. We are excited to hear about Baker Hughes insights on how a fast introduction of hydrogen in the energy market can be made while also keeping nitrogen oxide levels low. I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Christine. Welcome, everybody. I'm honored to talk about how we're helping our customer to decarbonize, where it makes sense, and Dyson is clearly the front runner in this space. The energy level spikes today. Today, we can redefine how we can save our planet to reach net zero. Human emission of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases are a primary driver of climate changes. In 1950, the world emitted 6 billion tons of CO2. In 2021, 36 billion tons of carbon dioxide and emissions keeps rising. We are also pumping out in the atmosphere other greenhouse gases such as methane and the nitrous oxide. The effects of climate change have become more serious and visible on the environment, society and global economy including extreme weather events. The only way to limit, to, to, to change, to climate, to rapid change in the climate impacts is to de decrease the collective emissions, quickly solving the energy dilemma called by the World Energy Council. As mentioned in a report from Deloitte, the focus on the decarbonization of energy sectors is well known. Following European oil and gas companies, US, Canada, and other companies joined the Net Zero Group in 2021. As we digest the recent discussion from COP27, it's clear that the boundary conditions since last year have changed. Everybody needs to do the best they can. One of our, of our goals is to offer ready technology solutions. One, uh, on the LNG value chain, Despite the majority of greenhouse gases emissions at the end of the user premises, there is a significant quantity of this producing exploration, production, and liquefaction facilities. Today, the main request considers more efficient plant configurations like gas turbines or electrified drivers. In the medium term, the application of new energy solutions will be predominant, like hydrogen, renewable sources, or carbon capture. Hydrogen, will, in, hydrogen in the gas turbines will play a significant role, being well positioned in terms of uh, readiness of the technology. Bechelux is engaged in many low carbon projects where we put our existing technology to help industry to reduce their emissions. Strategic uh, hydrogen cooperation are necessary to accelerate the adoption of hydrogen and zero carbon fuel. Leveraging on our OEM capabilities, we have started to fill the gaps space to play in all the hydrogen value chain. On production, we are focusing on all the low carbon hydrogen production technologies. From the hydrogen rainbow, let me say a few words on turquoise hydrogen. This is a novel approach to produce hydrogen and solid carbon from methane pyrolysis, thanks to the partnership with Econa. On transportation, we have 60 years of experience in compressing hydrogen. We installed the first reciprocating compressor in 1962. Within our centrifugal compressor portfolio, we developed the high pressure ratio compressor technology, enabling the increase the pressure ratio achievable for compressor body. This product will be a game changer in the hydrogen valleys. On utilization, we have 30 years of experience in burning hydrogen in our gas turbines. 
Furthermore, we are exploring other clean fuels such as ammonia or methanol, and we are planning our testing capabilities to support the required developments. In the past years, the usage of hydrogen as fuel in gas turbine application was limited to the application coming from refineries or chemical plants as byproduct of other processes. Bekerux has wide experience in burning a variety of fuels mixers with content up to 100% of hydrogen, more than 70 units installed worldwide. Specific solutions have been implemented in gas turbines covering from 10 to 130 megawatts. As you probably know, Bekerux already built the first gas turbines 12 megawatt, able to burn up to 100% of hydrogen for a combined power plant in a customer prototype environment funded also by the European Union. It was a PGT-10 gas turbines operated since July 2009 for a couple of years. It was the opportunity to gain a valuable experience and represent a successful milestone 13 years ahead of the CHU2 carbon. In Bekerus' portfolio, there are many gas turbines ready for a world with low carbon fuels. In the green are listed the gas turbines that are DLN, DLE combustion system. Current premixed comb combustion technologies are limited in burning hydrogen. Bekerus is going to develop a DLE, DLE combustion system able to burn 100% of hydrogen, having uh, 25 ppm or less NX emissions without injecting any diluents. In light green, you can see here gas turbines in the diffusing combustion system, standard or single annual, annual combustor. Heavy duty and novelty gas turbines family are ready or today capable to burn 100% of hydrogen. Diffusive combustion system offer full flexibility and flame stability, while the side effect is the difficulty to control the NOx emissions due to the temperature peaks. Water and steam injection or, or an SCR exhaust can be used to reduce the NOx emissions. I'm thrilled to be here to share with you a solution that could change the world for better. Mixing properly hydrogen and nitrogen in a blended skid allow to create a mixture that can be buried in a gas turbines with diffuse combustion system with a double effect zero carbon dioxide and low NOx emissions. Why nitrogen? Among the ionics, nitrogen is the fluid that can be available in, in oil and gas plant and can be produced through the air separation unit. Full gas blend composition can be monitored by full gas analyzer, while a continuous emission monitoring system will be linked to the control system that collects all the parameters. A smart digital control will have an active regulation with the fuel gas blend based on the performance and the measured emissions, giving a, a lot of value in a closed loop to have an optimal feedback without, MP, and without impact the engine operability. Let's have a look on a case study applied to the LNG plant composed by uh, uh, four different five gas turbines uh, as driver for a refrigerant train and the electric motor used as helper on the same shaft line. The current frame 5 2D are equipped with the DLN combustion system, burning methane. The proposed configuration is fueled with hydrogen in diffusive combustion system using nitrogen as blend compared um, targeting the same shaft power as per actual running conditions. Let's compare in this chart what are the outcomes. Zero CO2 emissions, an emission of 25 ppm, slight increase in the gas turbine's efficiency. The benefit of burning hydrogen from an environmental point of view is undisputed but the presence of hydrogen introduces a series of safety and operability aspects to be considered for the design of the, all the system in the gas turbine package. Design for safety is paramount and is strongly impact the low energy ignition of the hydrogen fuel. All components, including valves, instrumentation, pipes and fittings, have to be selected to avoid hydrogen embrickment. 
please consider that the most of the design standards to design auxiliary system are based on conventional natural gas. Here I describe the system to be evaluated on gas turbines flame to flange, package, and the auxiliary systems. Proposed solution has limited impact on footprint and could be performed during the planned measure overall, with only few new skids to be added on the existing layout. The Helux built the, its experience on several sites, different customer application installed and running worldwide. Let's quickly summarize the main benefits. Total carbon footprint reduction. Use of nitrogen will ensure that NX emission will be under control in the full range of load. Similar performance to the LN without the challenge related to the premix hydrogen and the air. Blending nitrogen produces a positive effect on power thanks to the increased expanding mass flow rate. Comparing it with the well-known wet solution, it will not cause any impact on maintenance and with it will not waste water. The solution can be also tailored for, for specific site operation requirements and emission limits. It's worth to mention also the next developments of the solution. Update the design of each, of each gas turbine model, package and auxiliaries for all gas turbine models to minimize the risk of leakages. In addition, using a considerable quantity of inert and hydrogen required to design full gas piping and valves to accommodate the increased flow. Let's, let's refer on the frame five engine mentioned in the case study. Becherugi is going to develop an advanced diffusive combustion system that will allow drastically reduce the amount of required diluent to reach 25 ppm or less. The good news, we have climate technology solution to food decarbonize. Nitrogen and nitrogen saved the world once. A century ago, the world faced a looming food crisis. Aber Bosch developed the process that react hydrogen and nitrogen under pressure to make ammonia, which farmers adopted in place of natural fertilizer. Hydrogen and nitrogen can work as DLE emissions. Will, this, will they save the world again? A special thanks for, to the Becker Hughes team that is working on this solution. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Marco. As a reminder to our audience, you can use the Q&A feature to ask Barry, Constantine, or Marco a question. We have just over 10 minutes for Q&A, so we'll go ahead and get started with one or two we've collected, um, and then hopefully we'll see some questions pop up in the Q&A chat. This first question I'm going to give to Barry. Barry, what are the biggest challenges around the deployment of drones for construction monitoring or for other workflows and how are they best overcome? I think um, traditionally the construction sector and, and the energy sector overall has, has been um, a little bit slow to adopt um, new technologies. I think McKinsey did a report, um, a famous report a couple of years ago, which was which was quite damning, which kind of said that, you know, construction in particular was, was an industry that lagged behind many in terms of um, a digital adoption. So I think that's really changing. I've seen a big change in that in the last three to five years in particular as, uh, as the value of, of digitization and, and leading into the, the digital twin conversation has, um, has, has certainly picked up. So I think um, a lot of the... Um, the, the, the difficulty comes from mindset a lot of the time, you know, and, and being able to adopt this technology, people thinking it's too difficult, people thinking that they can't control it, there may be accidents perhaps, um, you know, rather than kind of going into it with an open mind and thinking, you know, if we can work with you know, professionals with experience in this area, the value proposition is much greater. Um, I think in, in that respect as well, you know, I think there was, a, there was a, um, an article I read recently which said that a drone can cover 30 times the distance that a person on foot can in a day from a surveying perspective. So from that alone, you know, the productivity gains are there to be are there to be had. So I think in some parts of the world as well, though, um, it can be difficult. Um, you, the certain markets that we've really struggled to enter just because of the, um, the difficulty in gaining permits or gaining access to certain facilities as well. So that can always be a challenge. So it's good to partner with local companies who have that insight 
as well. So, um, uh, and again, from from a kind of construction monitoring perspective, I think, and I would completely agree, you know, it, it, there's nothing quite like being there on the site rather than looking at it on a screen. But we live in a different world these days and we live in worlds where, you know, we're trying to reduce our, our carbon emissions. We can utilize the, um, you know, the digital um, access that we have to data uh, much greater as well. Um, so I think, yeah, a lot of it comes, I guess the short answer is a lot of it comes down to mindset. But I think it's just worth knowing that um, that these solutions, these um, drones, the hardware and the software can be deployed with with very little, um, very little difficulty these days. No, I, I absolutely agree, Barry. Thank you. Um, I'm going to throw our next one to Constantine. Constantine, can you elaborate on how the digital twin is being used in unified process and power? Yeah, and. Uh... Most people think about digital twin is single dimensional digital twin. Um, in Schneider Electric and Aviva, we think in terms of digital twin as a comprehensive digital twin is the process digital twin and the electrical system digital twin and also is the, the equipment digital twin. And once you develop that digital twin, um, you can be applied throughout the whole life cycle of the plan, starting from the engineering, uh, which is automated made it when you as you work with epc companies you know we have a lot of changes during the uh, the feed phase and then the engineering phase i mean changes come by the minute right i mean revision number thousand so that had to be automated back and forth with digital twin uh even even when it's operation during the operation even the maintenance phase uh you make changes in the digital twin that had to be uh backtrack back changes back to the uh the design data that has to be automated. So, um, so two things: the digital twin had to be a more comprehensive digital twin. Number two is that the whole process of you, when you change a digital twin, you had to be automated. Otherwise, it'll, it'll be outdated completely. So, um, that's the philosophy we stand by: unified problem process to 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 approach for this uh, kind of a strategy. Yeah. Okay. Marco, it looks like we've got a few questions in the chat for you. Um, First one, how many gas turbines are currently operating 100% on hydrogen as a feed gas and what power are they delivering? In uh, the Kedus gas turbines, uh, the PGT-10 that I was referring before, uh, ran for a couple of years in 2009, uh, so, but at the moment it's not running. Uh, uh, and I believe that there are no other gas turbines running at 100% of hydrogen. We have uh, some gas turbines running at 95%, uh, was uh, a frame six that is running at this amount of hydrogen for the last 20 years. And let me mention also some gas turbines running at 85% uh, in, in Beherux gas turbines that are running uh, in the last 30 years. So it means that I believe it's important not only the value of 100%, but also the years that these gas turbines are running, no? so many years, so a lot of experience for this reason. Thank you very much, Marco. We have another in the chat for you. Um, is there a major change in the combustion system of the gas turbines to be able to use hydrogen as a fuel? Um, one of the most important updates is on the full gas no no nozzle that has to be sealed. While the gas turbines flame to flame could be the same. What is important is to design properly the uh, safety uh, and the operational aspects, that the operational system that are around the gas turbine package to allow to have uh, safe operation as for the methane. Thank you, Marco. Uh, you're very popular in the chat, Marco. Um, Thanks. This next one is also for you. Where do we see ourselves using hydrogen mainly in the near future? And can we really expect for hydrogen to be domestic someday? Interesting this question. I believe that uh, in order to decarbonize, hydrogen will be really the front runner because uh, uh, we can apply this fuel because it's well known because the gas turbines are already capable to burn under percent of hydrogen. I believe that uh, we are using uh, already hydrogen in refineries can be also a good solution to decarbonize the LNG, but also the pipelines. To, we need to build some infrastructure or to upgrade some infrastructure, but it will be so important in, lot, in many markets. 
At home, uh, probably we need to understand uh, the, the, the power requirements, uh, but uh, at the moment uh, the, we see a lot of market uh, on mobility. Not, not at home, but uh, mainly on mobility for uh, also some cars. Uh, some, uh, we will have some cars with hydrogen. Great, thank you. Um, this next question I'm going to address to Constantine. Constantine, do you see any resistance from employees embracing shifts in technology as an obstacle? And, and if so, how do you deal with it? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm talking specifically about decarbonization technologies. Mm -hmm. um, the decarbonization technology is available today. Um, uh, many of the question is, um, how economical, what is the positive, um, what is the ROI for this investment of the projects? So the technology is available and it's a consideration of um, the, the ROI of the project. And that one is on the fence because uh, as, as the renewable energy start coming down, um, the, the parity of price is coming to becoming a, a decision point whether you want to move forward with the project. Um, the third thing, obviously, for oil and gas industry is a little more conservative is the the, um, the acceptance of the people of the uh, these technology. But right now, this um, net zero is being driven down by the CEO. The CEO is driving, driving down this whole initiative throughout the whole company. So that obstacle is a little bit less than before. A lot, a lot more resistance of uh, accepting change, for example, decarbonization. But that's being imposed down from the top. So. Um, so all, all, all the obstacles are, are semi down. So I think that's why this decarbonization um, shift is going faster than we think it is. No, I think that that's spot on, especially from a, a decarbonization technology standpoint. Maybe I'll ask that same question because I think we'll get a little different flavor from yeah. Barry. Barry, you know, when you think about technology in the field um, and as yours certainly is, um, do you see resistance from employees embracing the shifts and, and if so, you know, how do you deal with it? I think whenever deploying new um, new technology, whether that's hardware or software, I think it's it's very important to involve everyone, you know, involve people from the top, as Constantine said, you know, the people who are driving this change uh, and changing mindset, you know, from, from, a, from a kind of a sea level within a business um, across to the people who are actually going to be using the tools on site and to try and help them understand the, the, the real value of what they're going to bring. I think that there's kind of, as human beings, we are naturally resistant to change. However, I think, you know, in, in such an operational um, environment like we all work in, um, where people can, especially people of experience, can, can see on sites how, how technology can improve their day-to-day -day life, whether it's making things easier, making things safer, uh, making things done quicker, and, and allowing people to, to concentrate on the, the more, you know, pressing matters rather than the monotony. Um, so um, so I, I think, again, the last three to five years, I think there's been a considerable improvement in terms of the um, your lack of resistance to new technology. There's kind of almost a little bit like there's too much um, too much choice, you know, which, which ones do you uh, do you look to deploy? But I think we're having much more mindful conversations now with, uh, with people across the industry and, uh, and regardless of job role about the deployment of technology. But like I say, it's important to to involve people from all different aspects of a business. But it's also important that you have a real understanding of what you're trying to achieve with technology. There's no point in deploying it unless you've got a, a, a goal in mind and whether that goal um, aligns with kind of strategic objectives that your companies, uh, companies agree to. Very well said, Barry, and, and couldn't agree more. We have time for about one more question. And so I'm gonna push this one uh, to Marco. Marco, can you speak to the cost delta between a natural gas turbine and an 85% hydrogen gas turbine? Yes, uh, probably we could consider between 10 and 20% uh, additional cost because we need to increase the safety and we need to uh, verify that all the equipment will be suitable for hydrogen. So I believe we can stay in this range up to 20%, not more. Thanks. Thank you, Marco. Appreciate that. So now I just want to thank our panelists again, Barry McGinn, Constantine Lau, and Marco Baldini for a fascinating webinar. As a reminder, uh, again, the Gas Tech 2023 
call for papers is now open. For more information, visit www.gastechevent.com forward slash call hyphen for hyphen paper. Finally, please note that you will soon receive email instructions on how you can access a recording of this webinar. And please do feel free to share that with your colleagues and peers. We thank you very much for your attendance today. This will conclude our webinar.